I want to base my nautically themed army in a suitably nautical environment, as one does. In the past, I've made a beach style base, but it's quite complicated. It involves sculpting sand patterns, and the moment you break out sculpting, it becomes a no-go for me. So, how can we make it work? While we solve one problem, let's solve another. I'd like to magnetize this army, but the magnets I have are a little too thick for the bases that these miniatures come on. A sane person would find a thinner magnet, but do you think I'm sane? Have you watched my videos? <laughs> So here's my plan. I'm going to use these cobalt keep bases that I've used on previous armies, match the size with the bases I'm trying to replace, create some kind of insert that fits right into the depression of this base, and cast it multiple times for ease of duplication. Okay, first things first, we got to measure the inner diameter of this top base recession thing. I'm getting about 24 millimeter. All right, let's move on before I have to use the term top base recession thing ever again. Then with my Cricut, I'll cut discs with that diameter on very thin styrene. These discs represent what I can sculpt on. They're at the starting point for the base. So let's get started with some detail. Similar to my table topper, I am adding a distressed pier-like wood to the bases. Using a wire brush, I scrape some balsa strips to add weathering to the boards and then clean off the small wood shavings with a Scotch-Brite pad. Steel wool works great also. Then, I cut lengths of balsa wood to fit on the styrene discs using more length than I need. I then trimmed away the excess so it's flush with the outside of the disc. I then glued these discs to some cobalt keep bases with the magnets in the bottom so I could hold them conveniently while doing future sculpting work and another benefit that'll be obvious later. With the remaining space on my styrene disc, I sculpted some wavy sand texture. With a layer of milliput, I cut shallow wavy lines with a sculpting tool and then widened and tapered the lines with silicone shavers and other sculpting tools. I found that a wetted brush can really help soften the rough edges of milliput you sometimes get during sculpting. Lastly, we need some sand texture. I took my dirt and filtered it through a stocking to get a really fine powder. I then took this powder and with some PVA glue applied it to my wavy sand texture. Now I have the shape of windswept sand dunes, but also the texture. I made three varieties of these bases with my intention being to have three that had sand and pier design elements. The other variety I wanted to include was sand and water. I started these bases with a ramp of sorts that I then sculpted my wavy sand texture onto. The part of the base that slopes down is where the water effect will eventually go. I then made three varieties of these bases for a total of six master copies. Because there are 12 infantry models in a unit in this particular game, if I cast these six bases twice, I'll have enough for a full unit. Lastly, I took some tiny shells I found at the beach and glued them to a couple of my bases in different locations, but not in the center to avoid them getting in the way when attaching my models to the base. I then realized that the balsa wood on my bases was creeping over the edge of my styrene discs, so I shaved them back so that they tapered inward. Let me take a moment to discuss why this is important. In general, I want all of the details on my base to taper inward, even if super slightly. It's easiest to understand why this is if I show what happens if I did the opposite. If I attached one of these seashells upside down versus how I did, what would the eventual mold look like? I'd have these two tapered pieces on either side of this microscopic shell. You could be thinking, so what, funny man? Put the resin in the mold and let it do its job. The problem is over repeat use. This tiny little piece of silicone will tear off when removing casted parts from the mold and that detail will be lost. Silicone has quite a bit of durability in large pieces. We wanna avoid making our mold have small weak parts. These kinds of situations actually have a term in the casting industry. They're called undercuts and they're avoided a lot. Before moving on to more casting goodness, let's hear a brief word from our sponsor. Cobalt Keep is a miniature accessory brand. Their bread and butter focuses around the usage of magnets. Cobalt Keep sells a variety of base sizes that you might find in typical games. But what's special about these bases is the magnet well on the underside, which allows for easy installation with a little super glue. Newer to their store are the display cases, which come in a variety of sizes for single figures and units. Display cases can stack for easy storage, but still keep your minis visible so you can see all your creamy blends instead of hiding it away in a case. 
From now until November 23rd, with the coupon code MOIST, you get 10% off all their display case offerings. You can also use Cobalt Keep's painting handles that have an interlocking pattern that, when combined with the strength of magnets, provides a nice snug fit when hobbying. They also sell a variety of base sizes for whatever system you play. As you saw in the video, I was able to replace my A Song of Ice and Fire ones with ones from Cobalt Keep for both infantry and cavalry. Keep your eyes peeled on Cobalt Keep's website for some larger bases on the horizon for your monster needs. You can find all of Cobalt Keep's links down in the description. Now, back to casting some bases. From here, I'm going to seal up the base with super glue thin. If I don't do this, I'll find little pieces of wood and dirt lodged in my mold, which will be transported to future casts. That isn't terrible, but I want my masters to stay intact, and I want my casts to look like my masters, so this dirt is getting stuck down. With my masters complete, it's time for some mold making. By the way, if you're curious what products I'm using, I'll have them linked below. And I have all my hobby products that I recommend down there as well. And they're all affiliate links, which earns me a little extra kickback at no extra cost to you. I grabbed a piece of cardboard and covered it in packing tape so the silicone would release better from it. I then plotted out how much space I would need for my six bases. I might have spread them out more than is necessary, but the stronger my mold, the more casts I can get out of it. With the size decided on, I could go about cutting the cardboard to make a box. Much love goes to Trent from Miscast Terrain, who was my on-call molding and casting professional. Check out Trent's channel if you haven't already. He makes excellent hobby videos. I sealed the corners of my box with more packing tape, but admittedly hot glue is probably the right tool here. I just didn't have any. I then stuck down my bases with some double-sided tape so they wouldn't move around while the silicone was curing, and I mixed up my silicone. I followed the instructions on the box for mixing and pouring and sealed my fate. Because my mold is a cube of sorts, I can do a little calculation to figure out exactly how much silicone I need to mix up so I don't waste any. My silicone had some wavy colors in it, which I thought meant that I had mixed it poorly. But when I went to demold, everything went fine and a little more than fine, honestly. The detail on the mold looks incredible, but we'll only ever know exactly how good it is once we cast it. So let's do that. Unlike my molding material that has a curing time of six hours, which is great to let all the bubbles come to the surface or pop, my casting material cures in 10 minutes and is much less viscous. You can't spend too long mixing, however, because the plastic will begin to cure in the pot, which means the viscous liquid won't capture the detail as well. I applied some mold release first to my mold and then mixed up my plastic. I mixed for about 45 seconds to one minute and then poured my six bases. This is when it becomes a little more obvious why I glued the styrenes to another base. It gives me a little extra wiggle room when pouring this plastic. In case I overfill the mold, it doesn't spill out on top, but rather in a slightly larger depression. After about 10 minutes of waiting, I pop them out to reveal gloriously detailed bases. I was truly amazed at the level of detail I was able to render with my basement first timer no tools technique. I was mentally prepared for some kind of disaster along the way, but I followed the instructions on the box and everything went very well. There are some small areas where I had bubbles in my mold, but they're so tiny that once everything is painted, it's impossible to notice. With more casting underway, I started to finish the bases alongside that process. First, I had to sand the bottoms of the inserts so they lay flat in my bases. You can speed this process up by sanding multiple inserts at once with a flat surface and some poster tack. With that done, I did a pretty simple paint job with my airbrush and some contrast paint and stuck the inserts into the bases. The fit felt really good and a side bonus here is that because I'm painting the inserts separately, the base rim stays nice and clean. I also stuck down some static tufts at this point to add more variety to my duplicated bases. With the bases done, it's time to attach the model to it. On the underside of Cool Mini or Not bases are two little bumps. If you clip off those bumps, you reveal a peg that seems like it's not attached to anything anymore. With a little X-Acto coaxing, you can actually pop the model off of the base at this point. This leaves you with a little plastic peg that you can reuse for your own base mounting purposes. So I drilled the hole in my base and super glued my models down. Lastly, I added some water effects and then I was finally done. If you want more of a specific look at the painting and basing process for this beach base, check out the base making video linked in the top right hand corner of the screen. That should do it for my Greyjoy bases. I'm really happy with the process and how they turned out. I might change the color of the sand to something more desaturated and less orange in the future, but otherwise the casts turned out great. If you do use mold release, which you likely should, consider washing your casted pieces in soapy water. 
I was having some issues with paint adhesion afterwards that is likely attributed to the greasy nature of mold release messing with my paint. I fully realize that this process is labor intensive and likely not very attractive for a lot of people. But honestly, this process isn't necessarily something that I would suggest you do. I'm doing it for myself, for my army. I think it's worth it. And while I can try to convince you that in this specific scenario, it was, people will always say otherwise. And that's okay. Here's my process. Take or leave it. Or better yet, take a portion of it and leave the rest. That's what I end up doing whenever I watch an instructional YouTube video. That's going to do it for this video, guys. If you like the channel and you want to support it, there are a number of ways to do it. You can buy my model, the Duchess, and a video instructional course on how to paint her on my website. You can buy hobby tools that I recommend using my affiliate links or support me on Patreon. All things linked in the description below. Subscribe or die! But most importantly, don't forget to paint my minis!